I was just next door to you. I'm gonna be watching. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today's uh, Forever Green uh, discussion and the presentation is gonna be made today. Um, as always, we kind of pause until about uh, 12.05 and, and uh, invite any comments, um, updates that anyone has that's online or here in um, in the room today uh, in person there's just three of us I don't know what we did long wrong last time <laughs> uh, but uh, so most of you are online just a couple of us here in um, in 408 uh, Hayes today so uh, does anyone have any comments anything they would like to bring up to the group today Sure, I'll chime in. Um, this is Mitch Hunter. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Associate Director of Forever Green. And I just wanted to let everyone know that um, last evening, yesterday afternoon, we had the first meeting of the Forever Green Initiative Executive Committee. And I think um, many people have heard about this new group. Not everyone has. Um, currently, it's made up of six elected faculty members as well as the so-called management team, Don, Nick Jordan, Colin Curitan, and myself. And so the 10 of us met to kick things off and start kind of a new era of leadership um, of the Forever Green Initiative with um, more broader and deeper input from across the, uh, the research teams that are the core of our work. So um, more information will be coming out soon, but I wanted to share that. I think it's a great milestone showing the development of the Forever Green Initiative. And uh, Jeff Berg here from Minnesota Department of Ag. Um, more information will be forthcoming, but uh, as actually, I think uh, last meeting, Mitch mentioned that uh, MDA received LCCMR funding to you know take some of these uh, Forever Green crops and uh, do grants for uh, enterprises that want to, uh, you know, grow more of these crops, you know, seed treatment to actually develop products. So uh, part of our charge is to have stakeholders tell us what this grant program should look like. We're gonna have two online stakeholder meetings. Uh, we're thinking, so don't uh, quote me, we'll send out information once it's finalized, but probably November 30th. And then uh, uh, I think it's uh, December 6th, we'll have two online stakeholder meetings to get feedback on uh, what this grant program will become become so thanks thanks jeff any other comments um, updates from anyone if not um, i'd like to turn it over to the perennial sunflower team and i think what you'll learn today is that the sunflower development program was one of the very original for Evergreen Initiative uh, efforts goes back a number of years. Had a number of graduate students that have been in, involved, and uh, Mikey Cantor may be online today. Uh, he's a professor uh, uh, at uh, the University of Hawaii, uh, and then Brent Hockey uh, was one of the original graduate students that worked in the program, and he's now the USDA sunflower breeder in, in Fargo. So the uh, production of high quality sciences has been faster than the development of the, the, the perennial uh, sunflower uh, crop. But I think Kevin will be able to give you an update today that shows that over you know, the last 17 years, we've been able to make good progress and and uh, looks like there may be some real possibilities of moving uh, this uh, new crop forward over the next number number of years. With that, I'm going to invite Kevin, Kevin Betts to come up and uh, make the presentation today. A lot of you know Kevin and the, the role that Kevin has played in the Forever Green Initiative. He's the, the individual that has helped move a lot of the forever green crops uh, forward, but he's had 
a lot of responsibility for the perennial sunflower program and and glad to invite him to to give us an update you know on the on the work so thanks kevin okay um yeah i i feel like we're we're close to getting uh some some really exciting results uh what i'll do today is go to uh where we started and where we are now uh, How do I advance with a ton of space? Hmm. Try um okay. Yes, so that is going to some I suppose you could just use this too. Yeah. That's kind of a fast way. Oh, okay. Arrows. All right. Um where we are now, we, we've uh, derived a number of uh, selections of, of, of an original cross between Jerusalem artichoke and uh, annual sunflower. We had, well, let's go back to the beginning. This is uh, when Brent Halkey was, was a student here. We, we started out by by making intercrosses with actually a lot of wild uh, perennial helianthus species. Uh, the one that worked the best for us was uh, the the cross with Jerusalem artichoke or helianthus tuberosus. We had uh, initially we had sixteen Jerusalem artichoke lines that we tried crossing uh, to annuals, and out of those we got eleven that actually took. Um, so from that that initial cross, we were hoping to uh, well ultimately to introduce perenniality into annual sunflower. So uh, from those inbreds, this way. Well, uh, well, Brent did a number of uh, back crosses and so forth, trying to to get a diploid. Uh, a diploid version of helianthus that that had the perenniality in it, and suffice to say, um, he was able to get diploids, but uh, no perenniality in diploids. So that's uh, that's where that kind of ended at that point. Our our next uh, round of work uh, kind of picked up on that notion of trying to develop a diploid helianthus. Uh, this is when Mikey Cantar started his tenure here. And uh, so he he did uh, kind of a, tried to re redo some of the things that Brent had done, but also he did a, a massive amount of work on, on traits and linkages and tuber inheritance, uh, along with uh, investigations into fertility and how these things were, were interacting with each other. Um, Again, the uh, attempt to develop a diploid perennial was not successful, uh, but you know, based on all the work he had done on, on trades and so forth, he, he arrived at the idea that maybe we stop trying to develop a diploid and stick with the tetraploid that we're getting and just select among the tetraploids for something that looks like what we're trying to get. Uh, Something that looks like the the annual crop version, but will still be technical. Okay, so based on on some of the traits that Mikey had come up with, I I kind of evolved this this ideal type of what we're trying to select for, and I'm looking for for single flowers per shoot, um, basically anything, what looks like you would think of as a crop uh, type sunflower, that was my ideal type. The only addition to that, of course, would be the, the addition of <clears throat> perenniality. So basically an annual type sunflower with perenniality was my ideal type. Okay, and then, 
after uh, Mikey's departure, um, Denise and, and, and Bob picked up a couple of uh, a uh, postdoc and a, a, a student that uh, looked at helped me with some of the, the more genomic type aspects of this. Um, I had a number of plants that I thought were the best things out of Mikey's nursery that I wanted to look at. And one thing that was was uh, plaguing us uh, all, all during this uh, this work was the amount of infertility in the flowers, the, the poor seed set, and, uh, and just basically lack of productivity of all these tetraploids. They looked good, you know, typically, but the, the seed set was always low, yield was always low, and a lot of times we had things like male sterility and, and uh, things like that that were just blocking any advance in the, in the population. Uh, what, what Jill and Adam did uh, when they came on was, was gave me an insight into what was happening more at the genomic level. Um, uh, we did uh, quite a bit of work with, with, we looked at some of our, our best looking plants and just to see what was happening at the genomic level. They, they did some flow cytometry and also some some pollen observations. Um, from some of Jill's work, we found that we see uh, some, uh, some, some slides of, of pollen of, of uh, annuals on the, on the left. You should see the small, si small uniform size, size and well stained. That'd be an example of a pollen that uh, produces really good seeds that, and then there are two examples of what you might see in some of the tetraploids. Um, the center one there would be, uh, you see the larger grains with some ununiformity in there, which kind of suggests that there's uneven meiosis going on. The larger size would, in, would be sort of what you'd expect with a, a tetraploid versus a diploid. Uh, that, that would explain the larger size, but I guess more importantly is that you see uh, a fair amount of those are not staining pink, which means they're not not viable. Um, so that that showed us that that might be one possible difficulty with our our seed set that uh, we we needed to select for things that had more uh, higher percentage of good viable pollen, um, and that's. One of the things that we set out to do um, in the in the next rounds going forward, um, we matched some of the good phenotypes to uh, some of the lines, or uh, some of the pollen data and the, the floydy data, flow data that we had seen. Uh, we had these uh, lines listed here, and, and there were more that were actually quite good, but uh, these. These are actually lines that, that become important in some of this stuff going forward. So I just listed some of these. And uh, theoretically, all of these should be tetraploids. And some of them are pretty close to four, but you have uh, one, uh, 1134, for instance, which is closer to five. Um, but, you know, they, they do set seed. Uh, so I, I'm not sure they're. I, I think one of the arguments was that uh, we have to be quite close to four for these things to, to work properly. Um, other the some of the other characteristics we see in these lines, well, they were selected for, for perenniality, so they all had rhizomes. Uh, the pollen abundance was another thing we, we uh, selected them on, so all these have high pollen abundance. Um, in terms of seed setting, uh, the self self seed set was very low on all of these, and that that was typical of everything in our population. Uh, to be honest, they they clearly have sort of the uh, the habit of the, the Jules and artichoke, which is it is itself a, a very poor self seed setter. Um, even outcross pollen, the the highest uh, number of seeds we we got off of. Uh, flower from an outcross was around 30, and that's 
that's not uh, not enough to be agronomically uh, useful. So that's uh, that's where we were at this point, and so we we had again we made several uh, selections through generations, trying to find getting actually quite nice looking phenotypes, but still the seed set was was extremely poor. Um, so what we our understanding at this point was that there are you know genomic imbalances that are probably contributing to poor seed set. Um, but another factor which I think was really under uh, considered up to this point is the possibility that there's some role of just the self infertility that you find normally in uh, Jerusalem artichoke, which clearly would have contributed to to uh, this to this uh, hybrid here. Um, so that seems to be what's being expressed in the entire population, but. Also, we thought um, since it's a hybrid with annuus, which has uh, a self fertility trait and should therefore produce seed quite easily, uh, why is that one not being expressed at all in anywhere in the population? So, um, I, I thought I would like to test uh, to see if we could unmask the self fertility from the annuus that presumably is there. Um, and in order to do this, uh, this test, uh, I, I tried to uh, recurrently sell uh, a lot of the lines that we just saw, trying to find something in the progeny of those cells that would, would have some improved fertility. The, the problem with, with that and why it's probably es escaped our notice for so long is that the selfing uh, produces very little seed. But in this, this round, we were really determined to get some self self-pollinated seed that we could select for uh, this trait in. So we, we pollinated, you know, 50 to hundreds of flowers on each of these lines trying to get uh, self-pollinated seed. And the rationale for that, of course, is that uh, by, by selfing, you're, you're going to uh, unmask certain traits. You, you drive everything towards homozygosity. So if, if it's possible to increase the expression of a trait, uh, you can do that by, by recurrently selfing a plant that's selecting for that trait. And that's what I, I was hoping we would be able to do with this. And we were able to get some self. Uh, this, this is the uh, one of the lines that, that we've been talking about. And I'm gonna focus on this one line as, a, as a, a template for how we can do this in other lines. And, and in fact, we are doing this in seven other lines right now and have been making similar progress to this one. This sort of will give you a roadmap of, of how we got from, from this point to where we are now. Uh, this is one of our, one of my favorite lines, in fact, it's it's got a, a reasonably large single headed uh, single head per shoot uh, flower, um, and it's extremely perennial. This one, I, I like the winter overwintering ability. Of this we have uh, some plants in the field that have made it through five seasons. So, in terms of overwintering, this one is it's very ideal. Uh, the Pollen production is excellent. Uh, the self seed set is extremely low. It's one of the lowest ones of all. On this one, I believe we, we crossed you know, in, into the hundreds of plants to get a reasonable number of seeds, of self seeds. Um, even, even if one out crossed, it, it doesn't produce a lot of seed either. But in every other way, it's a desirable plant. Uh, Here's, here's some tubers from, from 1129. They're, they're quite robust and it makes a lot of them. So um, this is the summer of uh, 2019 or 20. Anyway, this is, this is showing some of the, the self heads of, 
of 1129. So after uh, the selfing, uh, the initial selfing, we were in fact able to get seed from 1129 as well as other lines. And to compare, uh, 1129 is, is the performance of the parent in terms of, of seed set and so forth. Uh, there were many, many zeros. As a matter of fact, the best one I saw was five seeds off of one flower. And, and I, that is based on the number of, of seed scars. I estimated that to be 1.5% seed set. Uh, in, the, in the top line, this, this is a test of the, the female fertility of the plant in a way. What I did is I, I crossed the, the parent to, uh, to a mixture of, of annual sunflower pollen just to show that the, the female or, or the seed is actually, the flower is actually fertile and able to produce seed if given pollen that, that uh, is, is viable or acceptable. Um, so that's, that was sort of out, up there as a, a best case scenario for the, the flower. If given the pollen it can use, it can make 150 flowers or 150 seeds, I should say. So um, the, the seeds from these selves were grown up into plants and then self in the greenhouse. And out of the seed, each, each line is a different different one of the seeds grown into a different plant and then grown to maturity and self. And what we found were that there were, were in fact some, uh, some of those S1 selves that were able to produce seed uh, better than, than the others. Um, so in this particular one, we had uh, three, three of the selves which actually had a, a bit elevated seed set over the, the parent. And that was, that was kind of exciting. So those uh, S1s uh, were, you know, the, the, the seed we got off of those S1s were, was uh, germinated and grown to make uh, an S2. This is the S1. Uh, you know, one, one question you, that, that was always uh, in my mind was that if we, we increase the seed set, what would happen to the perennially with that, you know, seed set being an annual, annual trait with that, you know, would the perennially suffer if we drove it toward the annual? In this particular S1, this is one with, with a much improved seed set we, we found actually rhizome generation that was very similar to what we saw in the parent line. So that was kind of exciting. We, we now had uh, in, improved seed set along with, uh, with the perenniality that, that we were so afraid of losing. Um, in comparison, this, this shows what, what is the typical seed set on the left of the parent line, which is generally zero. And here's the S1 of that parent line with the improved set. So you can see there's substantial amount of seed set in there and the seed is actually real filled seed. It, it germinates into new plants. So it's, uh, it's actual seed set in the S1. Um, well, going forward, what, You know, obviously we, we thought a significant part of the, the poor seed set might be the pollen vari variability and all sorts of pollen issues due to poor uneven my meiosis and instabilities and so forth. But I, I think this showed that we had underestimated the role of something which is actually more, more of a benign thing and natural thing uh, being self and fertility, which is actually typical feature of the artichoke population. And maybe if we get rid of this, we can actually make some gains in spite of some of these other issues that we maybe have. So we, 
these are some lines, 1129 at the top. These are the best examples of an S2 cell where I've carried through the S1 that we just saw, self that into this next generation. And these are the best individuals out of each of those S2 generations. And we, we saw some pretty, actually pretty remarkable uh, increases in self seed set. 1129, which we were talking about, that, that had a nice size flower with uh, over 200 self seeds. And that up to this point, anything over, well, even, anything over 30 seeds per flower, even an open pollinated was, was enough to put it in the top five ranking. And now we're getting flowers that have in the hundreds of seeds from selfing in the last. Um, so 1129, which is, we just said that's one we're, we're going to follow through this, but other lines that have shown some pretty good progress in the S2 as well. Um, some in the hundreds or at least nearly 100. Uh, the other aspect of this that we were worried about seems not to be such a huge worry. Um, we were looking at the rhizomes and you know the consequent perenniality perhaps being lost as we improve seed set. And that doesn't necessarily appear to be the case at all. So in the S2s, I mean, there's some, some decline uh, of uh, rhizome vigor in some of them, but generally it's, it's similar or the same as, as uh, it was in the parent line. So I, I think that this is all very encouraging for this, this line of attack. Um, and the plan is, uh, well, let's, let's look at some, some of my favorite plants here. This is, this is an S2 of 1129. Uh, this is from, a, a, from the greenhouse. So it was, uh, it was grown from seed, uh, started in the greenhouse. And it, it's a spectacular plant. It's everything, almost everything I'd like in a phenotype. And the lights have bigger flowers and so forth, but it's it's got almost everything I would have wanted in phenotype. And this this is we had a, a whole range of S2s in the greenhouse, and this one was self as well as all the other ones. And this is the one that gave me 206 seeds. And I I put the the slide on the, the right up there just to show the the, the size of the seeds, as well as the number, but you see where I've, I've lined up the seeds from top to bottom there. On the left side, there are some different annuals, sunflower lines at the very bottom is tuberosis, the very, very tiny one. Um, so look at the, the, uh, the seed size on the right, which is from this flower compared to some of the annuals varieties. You can see that it's smaller, but it's really kind of getting in the same range as, as annuals uh, seed size. Um, and it was perennial too, which, which was exactly what you would have wanted. Um, so going into this field season, I uh, took a lot of the good material that was in the greenhouse and transplanted it to the field as well as the seed uh, that was used to generate the next generation. I planted that early on and, and uh, transplanted that into the field this spring as well. Um, so we, we have a, a lot of S3 and some S4 plants in the field now, but uh, this is a clone of that, that greenhouse plant that we were just looking at. We had, um, I, I was able to get uh, five uh, five clones of that off of that plant. So, um, so I, I put that into the field, and we redid that one as well. And uh, the oops. okay, and then this is uh, from some of that seed, that big pile of two hundred and six seeds. This is a plant off of that. So this would be an S three plant. Uh, uh, generating 
this will be self to generate S4 seed for the next generation, which will happen in the greenhouse. But uh, from this S3 seed out of this particular line, we had, you know, looks like good seed set at, you know, at least um, from the top, it looks like we have good seed set. We have perennial growth. Uh, we have generally good habit, uh, annual type habit. Uh, these are these are sieves of that plant. So out of out of that batch of seed that we planted in the field, we had I uh, I think we had seven plants that looked the way we want. So uh, there's still a lot of variability in in that particular generation and. That's something that we have to work through. Um, the idea would be that we want ultimately to have a true breeding line that would be close to what we're seeing there. So, uh, and I, I think at some point that will happen, but at this, at least for, for cycle three there that we saw in the field, there was a lot of stuff there that was not uniform. There was a lot of, uh, there are, in fact, were a lot of plants that looked very poor. Um, we had some good ones, but we also had a lot of bad ones. So I would say 80% of it looked like it was not, uh, not of a desirable type, and that, that will be eliminated. And it wasn't desirable in the sense that the plants were, were unthrifty, they were short, they might have been multi-headed. We had a lot of traits that were, were not really very desirable. And there seemed to be a lot of poor pollen production. Um, so all that stuff will be dropped from the population. And I'm hoping that uh, the, the six plants that, that I had there, the seven plants of the S3 generation will true breed and at least mostly give the same type phenotype in the next generation. If not in the next generation, we'll weed out the trash and do it again. And hopefully within the next two cycles, we'll have something that's true breeding for uh, the traits that we're looking for. Okay, and once, once that does happen, that we have this true breeding line, as well as other true breeding lines, then we'll, we'll begin thinking about yield trials. Um, and that will be, that will include all of our true breeding lines. Then, then thinking about possibility of inbred depression, what I'd like to do is take all the true breeding lines of different, of different genetic backgrounds and in, intercross them in all possible ways. And those intercrosses would be entries into a yield trial as well. So my yield trial I envision is having each of the, the true breeding lines being compared as well as intercrosses of those true breeding lines and annual oil seed checks as well. And this will happen in a replicated study at multiple locations. So we'll be looking at the overall seed yield of each of the lines as well as overwintering capability and disease and that sort of thing. Okay, and as I said, the S3 population is still segregating, so it's not yet true breeding. We have these, these are planted two feet apart. So we have the two tall ones, which are what we want, and all the, the other ones are, are actually sieves to those two tall ones, but they are not what we want. Okay, in, in terms of yield, <clears throat> it's been a long time coming that we actually start measuring yield. Now the, the plant that I, I've been showing you up to this point, the one with the good seed set, as um, you know, I'm transferring, translating yield from single plants into sort of a guesstimate for, uh, for a whole, whole field type area. So I'm giving a plant like four square feet and then extrapolating up to an acre yield. Uh, the plant that uh, I've been bragging about up to this point has about 670 pounds of seed per acre. 
out of a, a different line. This is the, the 605 line. It's also an S3, but you can see the phenotype in terms of flower number and so forth is completely different. This is a, a multi-headed type flower, but it has fabulous seed set as well. Um, this one gave me 75 grams of seed off of a plant and that extrapolates to 1500 pounds a meter, which is actually on the chart in terms of annual sunflower as well. Um, I looked at some varietal data for annual sunflower and the top, top lines were yielding 2,500 pounds, but also on the yield trial, the bottom lines were at about 1,500. So this is actually almost creeping onto the sunflower scale in terms of yield. And, you know, maybe it, it's time to be a little flexible about, you know, the single-headed phenotype too, because this, this actually would be a fairly harvestable plant. Um, with, it's got multiple heads, but they sit up fairly high. So it, there's no particular reason, I guess, it has to be a, a single headed to be a crop. It could be something a little different like this. Um, and the multi headed thing is, is more of a, it's kind of a valuable horticultural trait, too. So I, I always keep that in mind. All right. And that brings us to, well, these, these are actually some of the other S3 lines from other backgrounds that I have. Um, this one's, this one's uh, the uh, 1134. Uh, the things that we, we would like to select for would be seed size. So you know, these are, the seed sizes of some of the parent lines, but there's there's variability in some of these populations in terms of seed size too. So we can drive it closer um, to the annulus type seed size, I think, with with selection. Um, this just showing the the contrast between an annulus uh, type growth habit and a perennial type habit. One one thing I should say. In the rhizomes this year, this will be a tough year for rhizomes just because of, of the dryness of the weather. These these plants performed pretty well, I think, considering how dry it was. Um, normally in a more moist season, the, those rhizomes would be probably four times the diameter that they are there. But I, I think these, these may still overwinter reasonably well. Okay, and that's going forward. Uh, I would like to, well, to this point, we've, we've seen some improved seed set and we haven't lost perenniality. And I'd like to continue selfing to see how far we can drive that. And I, we might actually reach a ceiling with how, how high we can drive the seed set, you know, based on some of the other issues that are are in the genome. But one thing that's nice about the, the amount of increase that we've had uh, with the seed set to this point is that, you know, I, I think maybe we're getting into the, the crop level type of production, but if we fall short of that, one thing that we have done is made it possible to generate a lot of, a lot of variance uh, in, with all the genomic issues that it has, if we are able just to generate new variants of plants, there's a much greater chance we'll find something that that is perhaps sort of self-fixed itself. Instead of searching for one one seed and hoping that that has uh, has the alterations we want, we'll have a, a whole range of seeds there and we'll be able to look uh, look in greater detail and specificity for things maybe that have cloidy that's closer to four or something that has pollen that's uh, that's uniform in size and you know optimal viability and that sort of thing um just just the fact that we're able to get seed to to work with in and of itself is a, is a, a great step forward um 
one thing I would like to do is expand the diversity of the breeding population that we have that it is in fact setting, setting well, because right now we have like seven lines that, that are setting well, and that's still a, a tiny, tiny part of the overall population. So there are a myriad of traits that are in our population right now that we just haven't been able to access um, because we don't get seeds from them. So a, a way of um, restoring fertility to some of these lines that are really interesting to us would be to take uh, some of these high set inbreds, cross them to a plant of interest, and in that way, introduce the fertility into that plant and then put that on the track for recurrent selfing to, to increase the overall seed set and bring some new diversity into the breeding population. Um, these are some plants that have that have at this point do not have good seed set, and we've been trying to to find it by selfing. But if we are not successful in doing that, we have started to to back cross or cross these to to uh, pollen of high setting plants. So this is exam an example of one with a larger larger head. That's and then here's, here's uh, one with more of a, a wildish type. It's multi-headed, but has really strong perennially. Here's one that's, looks actually the, the headline photo of, uh, of this talk. This one doesn't set seed very well either, but it's got, uh, it's got a nice perennial habit and a single seed head size and great uniformity. It's got nice leaves, but it doesn't set seed very well. So this is one that we'd want, we'd like to bring up the speed as well. Oops. No way. And to be, again, another one with, with good phenotype, good perenniality for seed set again. So, Anyway, that's that's what I have uh, for you. So, if you have any questions? I'd like to like to answer them. So it's open, Bob. Do you have anything you want to say before we move into questions, Bob? Um, no, I think it's fine if people just want to ask questions. All right. So it's open for comments and questions discussion. One thing. Hey, Kevin, great talk. Sorry, one quick question. Is there is there any value in those really good seed set lines of trying to plant tuber pieces and and seeing what larger yields would be? Um, just just because I mean, with that level of perenniality, the tuber pieces could be, you know, basically super tiny, but still get reasonable numbers of plants. Is is there any value in that or is that just a bad idea? Um, in, in terms of getting a larger nursery, you mean, or what? It, it, yeah, and in ter yeah, in terms of getting a larger nursery and getting kind of a, a better idea of what, a better estimate of what yield would be, you know, yeah. um, because, I mean, because those tuber pieces from what we did in the past can be like the size of a pinky nail and still germinate. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll have enough just full size tubers to do do the, more of that next year. And one thing I, I should say about the yield, of course, is that 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 level of yield that I talked about was was with almost a hundred percent self pollination because every flower I had was self pollinated. So considering you know the the luck, luck we've had with self pollination historically. To get something that's 600 some pounds per acre of seed off of self pollination is actually in and of itself kind of <laughs> kind of a good thing. Um, but yeah, we'll be doing more uh, well designed yield trials going forward as soon as I have more plant material, and I I really think I will have more soon soon enough. So I don't think that's going to be a problem. Very cool thing. Your questions in the chat. I'll go on. I'll come here. I'll uh, 
I can read the question out if that's easier, Kevin, unless you got it up. If you want to, you can just click on the chat or otherwise, Mitch, Mitch why don't you do it? Oh, I think yeah. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Okay, this is. Let's see. Oh, okay. From David Marks. Uh, wonder if some of the fixing could be done by using using pollen to make double haploids. Um, maybe. Um, yeah, this. Uh, I I did dabble with that a little bit, and I didn't have tremendous success. Um, just in the, not not in results, but just in my ability to do it. I think. <laughs> But yeah, the double haploids is something that would be interesting to try. I, I just, right now I'm just focusing on getting the optimal level of seed set. But you know, when we get to some of these other, other issues with the genome, I, I think that'd be something very valuable to try. Duke, in the uh, annual sunflower breeding programs, is the use of double haploids is, is, yeah. is that common? In the breeding programs, um, I, I'm not aware of it. it. Does somebody else on online have knowledge of this? It's not. It's it's hard. It's an uncommon. There was um, the one guy at Fargo who was able to make it work, um, but um, CC Jan. But he's retired, and no lab has really been able to make it work since he retired. So Kevin, you did almost good, as good as anybody. Well, that's yeah. Well, there you go. I failed as well as anyone. <laughs> um, so I was just thinking, if there was a lab that was doing it, there would be a nice collaboration that could be that could be set up. Yeah, and that would be. I mean, it would be awesome actually because you have you you probably I think what David's suggesting is to take the original tetraploids. Yeah. Get their pollen, see if you can yeah. from haploids from them. And then you'd have potentially a really big population of immediate inbreds. Right. Um, yeah, at least in, I guess I, I have to wrap my mind around that a bit. They're inbred in the sense of yeah, they, I think that would that would work. I think that would work if the NBD inbred So if if, if, if you so want that would, no, that would be a diploid. I, I now, now I think about it a little more and it's I don't know how to make that system work. And Mikey, have you thought about that? I, I haven't thought about it just be, but I, I was just thinking that there's there's a new professor at University of British Columbia, um, Marco Tedesco, who's done a lot of tissue culture with sunflower and who's doing sunflower genomics, who probably would be into trying it for us. Um, if we want to, I mean, like, I'd I'd be happy to talk to him to see if he's willing to, to 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 mess with some protocol development for us, because yeah. my guess is he would for free. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think um, uh, and I and I spoke wrong twice at least in that previous statement, but I think yeah, I think that would be a, David's right. That that would be a immediate inbred um, tetraploid, which you could you could um, test for fertility at that stage. I mean. I, and and I, I thought a little bit, and, and again, I always think about this when I see Kevin speak on this, because I think about what eventually would want to be planted in a farmer's field. And I think what would, would eventually want to be planted in a farmer's field, um, and, and I'm guessing Mikey's thought about this a bit too, so correct me if I'm wrong, Mikey, but when you see this talk, does it come, does, does your idea go to the idea that you can identify multiple inbred lines that could then be up? F1 hybridized to make a higher, potentially higher yielding uh, F1 perennial plant that the farmer would actually plant true seed of, and then you know, hopefully maintain it in the field for a few years as a as a higher yielding version, sort of combination of these uh, inbred lines. Is that that's that's what, what I imagine. 
that's that's very much what I imagine as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's that's sort of the magic bullet here is if you can figure out a way to identify compatible inbred lines. But I do agree. I think Kevin, you, having these true breeding lines that no longer segregate to these really important architecture yeah. traits is really yeah. That would happen mm -hmm. first. That would that, yeah. That's exactly right. That's the precursor yeah. to what you're talking about, and that's that's. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and I, one thing that I would like to do that I don't have time for, but I would like to do flow on on each each step of these lines too, just to make sure that we're still heterophoric. I mean, what would you know if there was a, let's say these things slipped a chromosome in their triploids or something like that or diploids. I mean, that would be bad or it would be really great because these have perenniality and they're setting seeds. So maybe we backed into a diploid, uh, a diploid perennial seed setter by accident this way. I don't, I don't think so. I think they're tetraploids, but, um, but I'd like to test that to be sure. There's a couple other questions, I think, too. Are you say one drive phone? Oh, sure. Okay, from from Bo, who, uh, do these perennial sunflowers grow well in our cold winters? Any ideas on how they handle saline soil? Um, I I don't know about the saline soil, but yes, they they would grow well in in cold temperatures. Uh, Minnesota is a, a pretty cold climate, of course. So, and they they do overwinter here. Um, Either, either one season up to five seasons, depending on the line. So yes, um, Jerry Cohen uh, asks, this might be of interest, uh, title? The reference. The oh, paper. okay, I see. Uh, pinpointing genes underlying annual perennial transitions with comparative genomics. Okay, I'll take a look at that, thank you. Um, Kevin, just on the overwintering front, you mentioned both rhizomes and tubers, um, but it seems like you focus more on the rhizomes ultimately. So is that sufficient to well, the overwintering? Uh, we need tubers. Well, you, you probably should. Well, rhizomes will probably get you through a winter occasionally, but tubers are what you really want. Yes. So, uh, of course, the rhizomes are easiest to see. Um, sort of mid-season, it's easier to see a rhizome than a tuber. So a lot of times my data sees rhizomes, but it's pretty important that they ultimately develop into tubers to get that. that the tubers tuber. don't develop until late in the season. Yeah. Okay. September. Um, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Sure. Um, great work. Kevin, um, I, I, I have a rather ignorant question. Can you describe the typical growing cycle of uh, your perennial sunflower? Is it kind of, uh, how much uh, it, does it provide cover uh, during the winter or during other parts of the year? So when it's gonna be yeah. harvested and uh, kind of typical agronomic cycle? Yeah. Uh, the the life cycle right now is kind of artificial because I'm trying to get multiple seasons from field and greenhouse and all that. Um, but in in actual practice, what I think would happen is you would plant it um, probably in, in May. Um, it, it germinates uh, and it grows pretty rapidly by, by July. Um, by July, it's probably getting toward bud stage. In August, it will flower. And then in September, uh, you would think, well, September, October, you would start thinking about uh, harvesting the seed. Um, it doesn't make a lot of ground cover. Um, types vary, but um, in general, it doesn't cover the ground super well. Uh, I was thinking in an agronomic sense, I think it would actually, um, tolerate cover crops pretty well. So in a field setting, I would 
I, I kind of envision this being planted in 30 inch rows and maybe an understory of uh, some legume or some, some shortage grass or something like that would be feasible as a cover. And I, at least we're, we're selecting for types that will open winter very well. So in the next season, it, it, it doesn't start really early in the season, but it comes back usually pretty strong toward, uh, toward the end of May, probably. That's how I envision it anyway. So uh, it, uh, next season as a perennial, would it uh, start growing in which month? Uh, I, it would it would start growing when the temperature gets a little warmer. So it, it it's not the first thing up in the spring. I, I think it'll start uh, start seeing new shoots toward the end of May in Minnesota. Okay, gotcha. Uh, would it fit with a penny crest growing cycle? Uh, but I think it would fit very well with the penny crest growing cycle. Actually, yes. Oh, that's cool. Um, and uh, the other sort of unrelated question is uh, uh, some variety of sunflower uh, capable to produce uh, natural rubber in vegetative tissues. Mm. And uh, I was wondering, have you kind of looked at that? Or I'm sure you're breeding just for, as an oil seed, right? Well, uh, yes, uh, right now, but um, any kind of a, a feature like that would be of great interest, I'm sure. You know, if we were able to I identify that in any lines, that would be certainly be something I'd be interested in. Okay. Um, I, I'm currently helping in my kind of bi-January role, I'm helping a, a St. Louis startup that is looking into that. And uh, would you be willing to sort of collaborate? They, oh. they have the ability to measure it and uh, it, 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 would be, it would be interesting to look through his germplasm, you know, for that that uh, that trait. Yeah. And how, how how do you how do you assay that? How do you measure that? Well, uh, there is a wet lab method, uh, which is uh, not very trivial. But they using uh, that method, they developed an NIR curve, and it can be uh, quickly measured in the vegetative tissue dry leaf tissue by NIR. That's how they're doing it today. So there would be a lab that could do it or a company that could do it. <clears throat> yeah, that, that, that's a company here in St. Louis. In fact, they're using uh, cover cross NIR machine. Uh, <clears throat> they call well, we it cover cross. Yeah, we ought, to talk, we ought to talk about what uh, would need to be done to evaluate the variation for that trait in, in this germplasm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is that is that? Uh, I'll be happy to, to make a connection. Is that expensive to test? No, in NIR it costs almost nothing, right? It's you just put, put it, you scan it, and then it's just uh, uh -huh. test the time and and the disk storage costs so <clears throat> negligible. Always oh, looking for more for you to do, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I, thank you. <laughs> I, I, we, we, we go longer. We, we, oh, we're fine. To longer. I, I have, a, I have, a, <clears throat> I don't want to talk if, if it's okay. Um, I don't want to interrupt. It. Did Tim? Did you have more questions or? No, I'm done. Thank you. Um, I was just going to ask about the genetics, a little bit of that self compatibility that you see. Mm -hmm. So, w when a plant appears to be totally like almost zero self I mean it's self okay it has almost zero seed set yeah with selfing is that also have almost zero seed set if it outcrosses do you know that it it's uh well almost everything had almost zero set um but even if, if you the pollen, outcross it, it the pollen yeah with the, with what we normally had was four seed set from selfing from outcrossing, you get maybe 30. That was the top, 30 per flower. Usually there were less single digit flowers, even without cross. That, that's for the same lines that are self yeah. incompatible. But yeah, you now with these, with these selfing ones, 
the ones that are more yeah. self compatible um, in terms of outcrossing, they're even more. They're more bigger, more the self. Higher, yeah, higher sensitivity. And I, I think the explanation for that is that over the years we've had, we started out with a big population. Uh, many of them were were poor in some aspect. It's kind of just bottlenecked down to them. So even though we're outcrossing with other, other stuff in our population, I think genetically speaking, it's it's like self pollination almost. Yeah, I mean, it, that's that's great. And so one thing that it kind of kind of struck my attention when you showed that 1129 population and you had a table and said, mm -hmm. it looked like three of like the, maybe three of the eight plants were had quite a bit of seed yeah. set. And then the other five had almost nothing. Okay. So is that always, is that ratio more or less maintained across all of those in um, or is it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, so usually, I do a, usually seed sets poor in that yeah. selfing, yeah, and you know, over the years we've, you know, I've self things all along. It's mainly just to check of my technique, really, because I expected it to be zero, and it usually it was zero. And if I got got a seed, generally it, I didn't pay much attention to it, but generally it didn't set seed either, so I didn't really think much of it. But when I started thinking about this self incompatibility thing, I, I was really determined to get seeds so that I had some sort of population that I could look on to see if there's anything there and there was so yeah I mean it, 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 we would never I don't think in this population have the numbers to test this but it did it is sort of like a three to one ratio of seed the yeah. progeny that gave seed or had decent seed set yeah. versus those who did not it was like a, a one to three ratio I guess yeah, I, I what think that I to go. Well, it just it it looks like this. It's it it looks like it could be simple genetics potentially. Uh, yeah. In other words, it could be like a single single locus that controls whether or not these things are fertile. It yeah, might be yeah. it might it might be a map of the trait. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if anyone else. I I saw think that it might be, data. and I I have other comparable slides of other lines, and they actually show kind of the same thing. Yeah. You know, good line here, good line here, bad, 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 bad. You know, they're yeah. they're all kind of like that. So, but like, yeah, it, it, I would say, if, uh, I, I mean, I, I'd have to think about this a little bit more. But in your, you have the F. Sorry, you have the original hybrid. If the original hybrid gives rise to, I don't know, a certain population size, and it's oftentimes observed that about a quarter of the population is fertile, with the other three quarters is not that would imply that it, the genetics might be simple yeah but i don't know it was just one table with like eight individuals so it's yeah I'm just so if it's simple what does it allow it to do well i'm not sure i mean it, it might save you some time and crosses if you have to make because mm -hmm. you might be able, if you had a marker for instance that would tell you help you predict which ones are going to be fertile then you could maybe speed up and increase the enrich your population spend your time on the individuals that were mm -hmm. going to be your most promising. I guess that's potentially where it could go. But um, but I might just kind of be, you know, blabbing about it. There's a lot of assumptions built in yeah, there. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I think it's interesting though. I mean, it, it didn't, I, can, I expected the data to be a little bit more like in intermediate stuff. It looked like you were either, you were either fertile or you weren't. Yeah. Which is kind yeah, of interesting. Right. Yeah, that is true. Um, yeah, the thing that I'm, I don't understand well enough is about the genome is the various complexes in there. You have the annuous complex, and I, I'm not sure if I'm confined to that in terms of this trait. I mean, I can only enrich it within that that complex of the genome, and the rest of it, I, I'm just that are off limits to me. I can't do anything about it. I think that's what the case is, but I'm not sure. Yeah, no, it, I, I think the the design of selfing is is really really a good idea because I think I mean obviously you have good results to support that. But mm -hmm. as I thought about this, it's always something that we've wrestled with with this project: the tetraploid population. It's hard with these intermating to know how much we were getting rid of the tuberosis genome 
how much we were retaining with the annuist gene and all that stuff. But the cell feed, I think if you select for fertility in a cell feed manner, you kind of know what you're purging from tuberosis. You kind of know what you're enriching from annuus. I mean, I think that's what's, you know, you kind of, I, I, I don't know if we wanted to ever do this sort of, ask this sort of question, it's very basic, but like that, that the question of what regions of the genome are being maintained from annuus in these lineages. Like there might be a common, you know, locus that's shared by all of these uh, annuus, or these, something from annuus that's shared by all these lines that are showing higher cell fertility. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but I'm not, I mean, again, I'm not sure that's where we want to go because I think the project, with the way you, the way you got structured right now in the plan, it seems to be going in the right direction without that sort of, sort well, of yeah. tangential stuff going on. Sometimes, sometimes it's better not to know too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be distracting. <laughs> that 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 way you try stuff that's stupid, and sometimes it works. You know. Oh. Any other, Any other comments, questions from anyone? Yeah, on the on the plant performance side of things, um, as you look at some of these that have stayed in the field for four or five years, um, do you see their reproductive characteristics shift over time? Like some of the other perennials that we work with of shifting away from having high reproductive output, or is it pretty consistently um, similar? Well, all I can say is that that they they look similar. Um, having actual seed production to measure is a relatively new phenomenon for us. So uh, I'll have to let you know on that. But uh, okay. you know, I, I I know what you're talking about with the kerns and so forth. And I don't sense that this responds in the same way. But um, I, I know don't tell them why. Remind them why. Why? Well, it's a new tuber every year. Oh, that's true. Yeah. It's a hmm. new tuber every year. That's uh, right. Now that's 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 a good point. It is growing from scratch every year, basically. Hmm. Uh, Interesting. So everything does everything die back but the tuber, and then the tuber generates the new plant. Is that how it works? That's yes. right. Okay. Very interesting. But, but I think. You know, Mitch, that, that's a great question because, and that's something that I've always kind of asked the group over the years, is what happens when this thing, what happens when we breed the perfect plant, but it gives us 40 tubers per plant, and then the next season they're sprouting 40 seedlings. <laughs> how do you, I've never, I've never really wrapped my mind around how you would figure out a way to turn that into a. I think we'll be able to solve it. Okay. If we get some real plants. <laughs> well, that's what the question that Jim asked about the agronomics and things. You know, yeah. uh, those are all great questions uh, that uh, can't be answered until we have, you know, a, the first real idiotype, right? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, the, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, the number of tubers that it produces is such a big range that you really have a lot of stuff to choose from. Um, I think when Mike was doing all that, that tuber work, there were, were plants that made very few tubers, but they were extremely healthy. So, so that's one end of it, or you have one that made hundreds of tubers, which you probably don't want, but you did have some that made you know five or less. So, so basically they would just come up in the same place as the original plant every year, you know, because it wasn't really that many and they didn't spread out very far either. Mm -hmm. So Within that that sort of universe of tuber <clears throat> types, I think there's something that's probably probably would work perfectly. So we'll also have to figure yeah. out the thing someday. But again, not 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 until we have a real set of germplasm to work with. So the tuber tuber question is an interesting one, but down the road. Yeah, and an easier way of phenotyping than digging everything up. Um, I mean, some, some sort of remote sensing would actually make that question much more tractable because of, I mean, I mean, yeah, Kevin knows this, when we dug up the whole plants and you're counting hundreds and thousands of tubers on thousands of plants, it's not a good use of time.
<laughs> yeah, but look at the muscles uh, that you have. Mikey? Had, had done. <laughs> They're all gone now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, everyone, uh, we'll leave it here. And obviously, as you think about um, these issues you heard about today, uh, this team is wide open for ideas and uh, uh, to move this program forward. So after you've thought about it a little bit, um, make sure you contact Bob or, or Kevin with, uh, with any ideas that, uh, that, that you might have. Long we stuck in uh, for a long period of time. Kevin has hung in there all these years, and and that's what you heard today. You know, there, there's certainly progress, good progress being uh, being being made. So, so uh, take care. Have a good uh, weekend, everyone, and we'll see you uh, next Friday. Bye bye. Thanks, Kevin. Great job.